I am your host, James Morgan, and this is History of Cities. Episode 13, Event Horizon. We last left off with the crushing defeat of the Eastern Roman army at the Battle of Adrianople. The battle saw two-thirds of the army slain, and though they could never find his body, the emperor was considered among the dead. I, for one, subscribed to the conspiracy theory that Valens slipped away from the humiliating battle, shed his imperial cloak, and joined a roving band of entertainers to fulfill his lifelong dream of being a part of show business. Whatever really happened to the emperor, the fact remained that there was now no Roman army in Thracia that dared to face the Gothic horde. The remains of the eastern army, some 10,000 men, were now scattered and leaderless, while the western armies under the now sole Augustus Gratian were either still tied down in the west or too scared by the way the Goths had obliterated Valens' army to engage them. Luckily for the Roman citizens in Thracia and Moesia, the Goths were much better equipped to raid villages, farms, and small settlements than to siege larger walled cities. They first tried at Adrianople. When their attempts to breach the walls proved futile, they attempted subterfuge. They sent Roman captives into the city to pose as refugees, who would then set fires to distract the defenders while the Goths scaled the walls. This plan failed when the captives were interrogated and the plan was uncovered. Having met failure at Adrianople, the Goths marched southeast to the city of Perinthus, which we mentioned back in episode 6, when the city was able to repulse the seemingly unstoppable Philip II of Macedonia during his conquest of all Greece. Similarly, the Perinthians were able to turn back the Gothic invaders and force them to once again switch targets. Their next target would be Constantinople. What led the Goths to believe that they could take one of the largest and most heavily defended cities in the empire after failing at Adrianople and Perinthus, I do not know. Without an emperor, the capital was without leadership, but Valens's widow, Dominica, took up the mantle of de facto ruler of the city until Gratian could appoint a co-Augustus. This left her in charge when the Goths came knocking at the gates of the Constantinian walls. She used the vast personal wealth of the imperial treasury to pay any man in the city who would take up arms in defense. She also called upon a contingent of Arab warriors to aid in the defense. These Arabs were a pivotal factor in deciding the outcome of the siege, as they accentuated their mysticism to play on the fact that the Goths had likely never fought against Arabs. One Arab warrior ran out of the city in only a loincloth and slit the throats of a number of Gothic attackers. He then drank blood from their gushing necks, a scene which completely terrified the Goths and caused them to abandon not only the siege of Constantinople, but the idea of ever attempting to take a Roman city by force again. While our city has staved off invasion for now, the Gothic crisis continued for another three years. Gratian was unable to hold off an invasion in the west and simultaneously put down the revolt in the east, so in 379 he promoted the son of one of the western empire's most decorated generals to be his co-Augustus. It is not really clear whether Gratian chose this man, whose name was Theodosius, because he wanted to, or if he was forced by the eastern armies to appoint him. Whatever the case, Theodosius was charged with restoring order to the east, and he would have no help from Gratian. He spent the next year or so in Thessalonica, recruiting a cobbled-together army of farmers and Gothic mercenaries. By the time his army was starting to take shape, the Gothic forces had split. The Gruthungi went west to Illyria, while the Thirving went south into Macedonia and Thessaly. This was a terrifying prospect for the Romans, as until this point, the revolt had been mostly contained to Thrace and Moesia. This containment came at the cost of the systematic slaughter of Goths living in other provinces. Now that the Gothic armies were breaking out, there was an opportunity for reprisals. Theodosius moved quickly to engage the Thirving, while Gratian cut a deal with the Gruthungi, which gave them ownership of the province of Pannonia and Illyria, in return for deference to Roman authority. Upon meeting the Thirving army in the field, Theodosius's force instantly dissolved as the farmers deserted and the Gothic mercenaries defected. Now having free reign in Macedonia, the Thirving set themselves up as the overlords of that territory and extracted tribute from the Roman cities. This situation continued for about a year or so until Gratian finally offered to help Theodosius drive the Thirving back into Thrace. Together they accomplished this goal, and Theodosius was finally able to enter Constantinople. While the two Augusti were able to re-establish a sort of status quo, they were unable to fully put down the rebelling armies. So in 382, peace negotiations were opened. On the 3rd of October 382, the Gothic War finally came to an end. The 
the terms of peace largely reflected what had been the original intention when Valens first let the Goths cross the Danube into Roman territory. The tribes were given lands to settle in, and in return they would assist Rome militarily. The consequence of the five years of conflict was that now the Romans were in a much less stable position going into the future. Unlike how they had originally planned, the Goths were not dispersed amongst the Empire, but were instead allowed to rule over lands within the Empire under their own authority as a collective people. This meant that the Roman Empire now had not totally reliable allies living within their borders who could leverage their military power to get concessions from the Romans. This new relationship between the imperial authority and its nominal subjects led to a much more unstable empire and eventually caused the sacking of Rome in 410. For now, however, we will return to Constantinople, where Theodosius I will have a few important contributions to make. Theodosius was born in Hispania in 347 to a family that had no blood connections to either the Constantinian or the Valentinian ruling dynasties. The patriarch of the family, Theodosius the Elder, was still able to establish himself among the upper echelon of military men through merit and minor aristocratic position in Hispania. From this position, Theodosius the Elder was able to bring up his son into the military, where he quickly excelled and took personal command of a province after only six years in the service. This posting did not last very long, despite the fact that Theodosius was successful in fending off a Sarmatian invasion. His father had gotten himself tied up in a political debacle and ended up being executed by Emperor Valentinian. Theodosius, now ahead of his family, decided it would be prudent to retire to his family estate in Hispania and stay out of imperial politics for the rest of his hopefully long life. In the chaos that was Roman politics, especially in the Western Empire, it is best not to get too attached to any long-term plans, as it only took two years for the tables to completely turn again, and by 377 Theodosius was back in command. It would only take another two uneventful years until the man that had so recently been prepared to never enter imperial politics again was being proclaimed Augustus by a hastily put-together council in response to the surprise deaths of Valens at the Battle of Adrianople. We have already gone over the earliest years of Theodosius's time as Emperor of the Eastern Empire, but I want to highlight two important events. One is a life-threatening illness that the Emperor barely survived, and which caused him to accept baptism into the Nicene Christian Church, a faith he would follow devoutly for the rest of his reign. The other event is the end of the Gothic War, or most importantly, how it ended. It was not because of a great battle, or the spilling of an ocean of blood, but the gradual acceptance by Theodosius that the Goths could not be dealt with militarily that ended the war with a negotiated peace that arguably favored the barbarians more than the Romans. These two events lay the foundation for Theodosius's more gentle approach to maintaining peace with the empire's neighbors compared to his predecessors. While he was not averse to using military power to achieve peace, Theodosius did recognize the limitations of such power and the value of picking your fights. This is not to say that Theodosius's reign was free from bloodshed, far from it, but he was more diplomatically minded than Valens or Valentinian. Theodosius also spent a lot more time in Constantinople than his predecessor had, and made more important contributions to the practice of Christianity within the Roman Empire. A few months after the conclusion of peace between the Romans and Goths, Theodosius celebrated the Quinquinalia or public games hosted every five years on the fourth anniversary of his ascension to imperial office. During the celebrations, Theodosius promoted his son, Arcadius, to the position of co-emperor, even though the boy was only six years old. He later promoted the widely popular and capable statesman Themistius to Prefectus Urbi, or Urban Prefect. Now I haven't mentioned this office yet in this series, but its existence dates back before the founding of Byzantium. It was originally called the Custos Urbis, or Guardian of the City by Romulus. Its responsibilities lay in the administration of Rome, and was second in command only to the king himself. The office persisted throughout history, outliving the Roman Kingdom, the Roman Republic, and the Western Roman Empire. When Constantine moved the capital to Constantinople, it became the second city, after Rome, to have an urban prefect. In modern terms, we could think of the prefect as both a mayor and a governor, as his authority stretched to the provinces that the capital lay in. Themistius had previously held the office for a year, when it was still called proconsul under Constantius. When Julian came to power, Themistius was one of the few administrators that retained his position, 
likely due to the fact that he was a pagan and a philosopher, both things that Julian regarded very highly. He would continue to serve the imperial court during the reigns of Jovian and Valens, until Theodosius raised him to the rank of urban prefect in 384. He would serve in this role and as a personal teacher to the young Arcadius for four years until he dropped out of the history books. The urban prefect of Rome and Constantinople is a role that is scarcely ever mentioned in the popular histories of the empire. Most books and documentaries focus on the much more dramatic emperors to capture their audience's imaginations, but it is important to remember the subtle bureaucrats working behind the scenes tirelessly and adeptly that really made the Roman state last for thousands of years. That being said, we should return to talking about emperors, because while Theodosius was having a great time in Constantinople, his colleague Gratian was having a considerably more miserable time in the West. Early in 383, Gratian's wife Constantia, last thread of the Constantinian dynasty, died, marking the beginning of Gratian's downfall. Soon after, legions in Britannia that were upset with Gratian's predilection towards barbarians within the army raised Magnus Maximus to the rank of Augustus. In just a few days, the armies of Maximus met Gratian in Lyon, in Gaul, and took him prisoner. He was later murdered during a banquet, and Maximus declared himself ruler of the Western Empire. Back in Constantinople, Theodosius was forced to accept this turn of events, as he was unable to leave. It turns out, 383 also saw the changeover of rulers in the neighboring Sassanid Empire. Theodosius was wary of the new king of kings, Shapur III, and so he could not march his armies west to put down the usurper until stable relations were established between the Persians and Romans. Although Theodosius spent much more time in the capital than any of his predecessors, except maybe Constantine, we can see by this development with the Maximus the beginning of a trend that will continue for the next few generations of Roman rulers. This trend being the political decay of the Western Empire sucking the attention of the Eastern Emperor like a black hole, until finally in 476, the last Western Emperor will be deposed, and the lands west of the Balkans will become just another border region. But during Theodosius's time, he would have to take extended trips out of Constantinople to try and wrestle the West into a more sustainable condition. Once again, we will see the forces of history constraining the ability of singular people to make change, as no matter how hard Theodosius or his successors tried, the fall of the Western Empire, while not inevitable, was too much for them to arrest alone. As a result of the other half of the empire being such an irresistible gravitational force pulling Theodosius, the remaining events we are going to talk about this episode take place outside of our city. Before we leave, however, I want to highlight some of the physical changes Theodosius brought to Constantinople. His crowning achievement was the expansion of the Forum, originally built by Constantine. Theodosius made it the largest public square in antiquity, and added a few personal touches, like a column in his honor, and a triumphal arch that included statues of himself and his two sons, Arcadius and Honorius. Indeed, most of the things that Theodosius built were in service of the imperial family's image. Many public statues and pieces of art were commissioned in his, or his son's, or his late wife's image, so that the citizens of Constantinople could always see who held power over their lives. It is not entirely due to the emperor's ego that such vanity projects made up the bulk of his public works, as most of the dull practical building had been done by the emperors before him. However, by the time of his reign, the city had already grown beyond the old walls built by Constantine, and before long new ones would have to be built to keep the city safe from invaders. These new walls would be one of the most famous and long-lasting defensive structures in history that would bear Theodosius' name. That is not actually because he built them, but just a stroke of luck that his grandson, Theodosius II, who did build these magnificent walls, just happened to be named after him. So it is due to that stroke of luck that Theodosius I gets undeserved credit for one of Constantinople's most recognizable structures. Returning to the historical narrative, after Maximus took control of most of the Western Empire in 383, Theodosius went on a spree of diplomatic negotiations to try and create an atmosphere in which he could vacate his armies from the east to re-establish control over the west. In 384, he received an embassy from the Sassanid Empire and mediated a tentative peace agreement between Maximus and Valentinian II, who still ruled over Italy from Milan. At the tail end of 384, Theodosius' second son, Honorius, was born, and the emperor began making plans to have the empire split between his sons when he died. In 387, Theodosius finally procured a formal peace agreement with the Persians, 
which ended hostilities between the two empires for the longest period since the conflicts known as the Roman-Persian Wars began way back in 54 BC. Theodosius took this break in hostilities as his chance to finally deal with the thorn in his western flank. It was just in time too as in 387, Maximus broke the Fagil peace and invaded Italy, ousting Valentinian from Milan. Maximus's triumph would not last long, as in 388 the combined forces of Valentinian and Theodosius re-entered Italy and pursued the usurper until catching him in Aquileia. The soldiers in charge of watching Maximus knew of Theodosius's reputation for forgiveness, and so before the emperor could pardon the traitor, they took matters into their own hands and killed him. With order finally restored in the west, Theodosius was content to visit Rome before returning first to Milan to hammer out some administrative tasks and then hopefully settle back down in Constantinople. Unfortunately for the now middle-aged emperor, the black mark that defined his reign was about to hit him full force. This event took place in the Greek city of Thessalonica in the year of 390. The story of this event is passed down to us from a series of secondary accounts from church historians. These accounts often contradict each other, and the absence of any first-hand facts to cut through the fog makes the exact nature of the incident impossible to discern. However, there is enough mention of it from relatively trustworthy and independent sources that we can assume that it did actually take place, and the vague details of it are accurate. The event, known to us as the Massacre of Thessalonica, began when the captain of the Imperial Garrison arrested a popular chariot racer for unknown reasons. This captain was a man named Botheric, whose name suggests that he could have been a Goth. Some modern historians make note of this as a possible impetus for what is about to happen. As the charioteer was being held in the Imperial Garrison headquarters, a crowd began to form outside, demanding for his immediate release. Botheric of course told them that he took his orders from the Emperor, not from some unruly sports fans. Eventually, the crowd's anger grew until the seal broke and they stormed the garrison, killing Botheric and fearing the charioteer. When Theodosius heard news of what had happened, he was reportedly enraged and ordered the soldiers in the city to regain order by any means possible. Some modern historians believe this telling of the story stands on shaky ground and is likely used to shift blame away from the overzealous soldiers and on to the emperor. Whomever's fault it was, the result was the same. 7,000 Thessalonian citizens were butchered by the imperial garrison in retribution for their fallen captain. When news of the massacre reached Theodosius in Milan, he was horrified. He had earlier sent a countermanding order to stop the soldiers from doing anything rash, but it appeared to not have arrived in time. Compounding this humanitarian and public relations catastrophe was the Archbishop of Milan, a man named Ambrose. We will go over Ambrose's history in greater detail at the end of this episode, when we discuss Theodosius' dealings with the Christian church, but for now, the archbishop was furious at the emperor for allowing such a violent action to be done in his name. Ambrose had advised Theodosius from the start to use a gentler and more pragmatic hand in dealing with the crisis, but the emperor, against his better nature, had reacted with anger. The archbishop was a very powerful man in the church, more powerful even than the pope in Rome, and he used this power to chastise the emperor himself, demanding that Theodosius show penance for his sin before Ambrose would allow him to receive Holy Communion again. For the first time, the imperial crown bent to another authority, and Theodosius complied, marking a shift in the power dynamics between the church and the throne that would alter the course of history. After finally resolving this debacle from his court in Milan, Theodosius was happy to return to Constantinople, content that the West was firmly in the hands of Valentinian. Before Valentinian could be confirmed as the true ruler in the west, he had to relieve the governor of Gaul, a man named Arbogast, of his duty. Arbogast had been de facto ruling over the western empire in Theodosius's name, and when Valentinian arrived in Vienna to preside over the transfer of power, he encountered not a pliant civil servant, but an obstinate rival. What followed is probably the most obvious fake suicide ever, as within a few days the 21-year-old Valentinian was found hung in his bedchamber. Even though Theodosius had been the one who put Arbogast in charge of Gaul, after the defeat of Maximus, he did not want him as his imperial peer. For one thing, it was impossible for Arbogast to rise to the rank of Augustus, as he was an avowed pagan, but he was able to put forward a surrogate that he used his considerable influence in the West to have him proclaimed emperor, even in Italy where Ambrose objected to this obviously pagan-friendly puppet. 
still stewing over the fact that he would certainly have to leave Constantinople again. Theodosius initially responded with evasive messaging that neither outright rejected Arbogast's man or fully accepted him as co-Augustus. Finally, nearly a year after Valentinian's apparent suicide, Theodosius raised his son Honorius to the position of emperor, effectively declaring his direct opposition to the pretenders in the west. With civil war right around the corner, Arbogast secured the support of the Roman Senate, who were much more pro-pagan than their eastern counterparts, as well as the support of a number of western provincial governors and generals. Both sides also recruited a large number of Gothic federate, or those barbarians that had been settled in previously Roman lands. The climactic battle of the Civil War saw massive casualties, particularly to these Gothic federati, and ultimately Theodosius was the victorious. The lasting results of this battle were that the federati's position was weakened by the heavy loss of fight-ready men, but the Western Roman legions suffered even greater in the years to come, and had they not been so utterly wiped out during this war, then the collapse of the Western Empire could have possibly been delayed. The immediate aftermath of the war saw the execution of Arbogast's man and his patron's suicide. With no more rivals left in the field, on the 8th of September, 394, Theodosius became the last man to hold undisputed dominion over the entire Roman Empire. The time that Theodosius would have to enjoy the zenith of his power and prestige would unfortunately be very brief. After celebrating his victory with his son Honorius in Milan on the first day of 395, Theodosius was too ill to return to Constantinople. Sixteen days later, Theodosius the Great died in Milan, and the empire that he had united for a mere five months was split among Honorius in the west and Arcadius in the east. From his deathbed, it is possible that Theodosius believed he had done the impossible and brought lasting stability to the Roman Empire. Once again, a single family ruled both halves. The Goths had been turned from rampaging foreign invaders into respectable allies, the Roman-Persian wars had ceased for the first time in centuries, and the empire belonged to the one true faith under the one true God. He probably thought himself worthy of the title, The Great, though he certainly was not nearly as great as his peers. In hindsight, the work that Theodosius had done during his 16 years as emperor was like putting a fresh coat of paint on a rotting foundation. Less than a century after his death, the Western Roman Empire would cease to exist, and it was not a sudden or pretty ending. The Gothic peoples that lived within the empire would push against Roman authority and prove to be a nuisance for centuries. The peace with the Persians would not last forever, and they would remain a principal rival of the nascent Byzantine Empire. Most of all, the church would continue to quibble over doctrinal issues, constantly splitting and forcing Christians to choose a side. He was not a cruel emperor, and aside from the unfortunate incident in Thessalonica, he practiced a gentle diplomatic policy that avoided a lot of bloodshed that certainly would have occurred under his more bloodthirsty predecessors. For our purposes, he certainly enjoyed spending time in cultivating the culture of Constantinople more than his predecessors. From 337 to 369, the capital had hosted the emperor for only nine total years. The neglect was a little insulting, and at some points there was talk of Antioch or other cities taking the crown. Theodosius helped remind everyone that there was a reason Constantine wanted this city on the Bosporus to be the center of the world. But maybe Theodosius does deserve to be called the Great simply for what he represented, the last great Roman emperor. By the time the empire gets another ruler of his caliber, the West will no longer exist. He was the last to rule the United Empire, and diligently worked to maintain it, even if he could not overcome the deep structural issues that plagued it. To round out this episode, I want to go over Theodosius' dealings with the One Faith, and how he maybe deserves the title of First Christian Emperor more than Constantine. To understand what makes Theodosius unique, we must look at the specific beliefs his predecessors had. Constantine the Great was the first emperor to declare his faith to the Christian god openly. However, during his time, that became more of a complicated identity than he really expected. The rapid spread of Arianism through the eastern half of the empire threatened to split the church permanently and forced church officials to pick a side. Constantine did not care for all this doctrinal nonsense so he waffled between supporting Arius and his rivals Alexander and Athanasius. In the end, Constantine failed to keep the church united. His son Constantius was labeled as an Arian, but his attempts to find a compromise between Arianism and the followers of the Nicene Creed 
meant he was more of a semi-Aryan than a crusading zealot. His attempts to find common ground also failed to mend the rift in the church. Julian obviously didn't follow either Arian or Nicene thought, but he did end the exile of many Orthodox bishops in hopes of causing the schism in the church to rip it apart completely. His plot also failed to either unite or ruin the church, as the Christians may have hated each other, but they weren't about to tear everything down and let the pagans back in control. Jovian was the first emperor who followed the Nicene Creed, but he only had enough time to reverse the damage Julian had done before he passed away. Valentinian I and Valens had a similar relationship to Christianity that Constantius had. They were baptized by Arian bishops, but for the most part they were uninterested in pursuing a hardline policy either way, and the civil war within the church continued to trundle on. Finally, we come to Theodosius, who was a devout and energetic follower of the Nicene Creed. He wasted absolutely no time in making his position known, as in February of 380, before he had even stepped foot in the capital, he issued the Edict of Thessalonica, which was directed to Constantinople and decreed that only those who believed in the consubstantiality of the Holy Trinity could be labeled as Catholic, and all others were heretics who did not belong in God's house. This edict is often marked by historians as the point in which the Roman Empire finally declared Christianity to be the state religion, making Theodosius, at least policy-wise, the first emperor of a Christian state. Other more modern historians don't really frame the edict as so grand in its design, as it was focused mainly on Constantinople and so had very little effect on the larger empire when it was passed. Additionally, it did not give special preference to Christianity over, say, paganism or Judaism, and members of those faiths were not forced to convert to Christianity. It did, however, emphatically lay boundaries around who could be considered Christian, and the Arians were firmly outside of those boundaries. Upon arriving in Constantinople, Theodosius appointed new patriarchs in Constantinople and Antioch, the two most important Christian cities in the east. They would help him prepare for the second ecumenical council after Constantine's first council of Nicaea. This council was held in May of 381 in the capital, and the main issues on its agenda were the definitive destruction of the various heresies, including Arianism, the revision of the Nicene Creed to iron out some questions on orthodoxy, and the reordering of church hierarchy after the purging of Arian clergymen in the east. Importantly, the council decreed that Constantinople would be the second most important see after Rome. This provision, along with the fact that the council had been held in Constantinople, and led by eastern bishops that the pope did not approve of, meant that along with political and economic power, religious power was shifting to the east. The lasting effects of this change would not be felt immediately, but rest assured, our future exploration of the Christian faith in Constantinople will be built on this foundation. The empire continued for centuries to host a variety of different cults and religions, of which Catholicism was only one and not even the majority. Theodosius's legacy then is not of the dramatic vanquishing of paganism, but the solidifying of Christianity's position from which it would eventually eclipse all other religions. All in all, Theodosius's death marks the end of an era with the fading of the West, the attempted integration between the empire and various barbarian nations, the continuing rise in popularity and power of the Christian faith, and the increase in importance of Constantinople and the imperial court that inhabited it. This meant that the empire that Theodosius' successors would rule over would be incredibly different compared to the one that had persisted since the end of the Republic. In the face of the new, we see a reflection of the old, but the medieval period was fast approaching, and for better or for worse, the world that Constantinople was the center of was changing dramatically. We will end the episode on that note. As always, if you have any questions or think I missed anything, please feel free to email me at hofcpod.cast at gmail.com or DM me on Twitter at hofc underscore podcast. Thank you for listening to this episode, and please join me next time for the history of Constantinople.